Hi, I'm Mark Barsamian. In this video, I'll be discussing using properties of the definite integral. This material is from section 5.4 of the book. More specifically, the last couple of pages of that section, pages 364 to 365, examples 3 and 4. The corresponding homework is this collection of six exercises from section 5.4. Recall the definition of the definite integral from the previous video. The words are the definite integral of f of x from x equals a to x equals b. The symbol is this thing. Notice that that symbol is sort of a decorated indefinite integral symbol. It has this curvy s-like thing. It has the dx. It has the integrand little f of x. But it has these new things this x equals a at the bottom of that curvy s-like shape, and this x equals b at the top. Alternate words for the definite integral are these. The signed area of the region between the graph of f and the x-axis on the interval a comma b. An alternate symbol that I use is just this sa to denote signed area. The book doesn't use that symbol, but I, I find it helpful. Now, when is this symbol used? Remember that you use this when f of x is a continuous function on the interval a to b. And what does this symbol mean? Well, it means the number that is the limit of the left sums, L subscript n, as n goes to infinity. It's also the value of this limit, the limit as n goes to infinity of r subscript n, that is the value of the right sum with n rectangles. So we have this string of, of, of equalities. This thing, the signed area, which is denoted by this symbol, is defined to be this limit, the value of that limit, which is also equal to the value of this limit. This video is going to be short. I'm just going to do some examples involving computing some definite integrals. So in example one, the graph of a function f of x is shown. And on that graph, some shaded regions are labeled with letters. And we're given the areas of those shaded regions. Now these are unsigned areas. Our job is to find the value of these definite integrals. So the first one is that one. The definite integral from x equals negative 4 to x equals 3. Now remember what that means in terms of the graph. That means the signed area of the region between the graph of f and the x-axis on the interval a to b. And it means signed area. In our case, the interval is from negative 4 to 3. So let's mark those endpoints on our graph. So those are the endpoints of the interval. We're supposed to consider the signed area of the region between the graph of f and the x-axis. Now remember what signed area means. That means that regions above the axis get a positive area. Regions below the axis get negative areas. So the value of this definite integral will be the number negative 1. I took the negative of b because region b is below the axis. I used the letter c with a plus sign because region c is above the axis, and so forth. The next integral that we're supposed to find is this one, the integral from negative 2 to 5. Well, you can see that all that's changed is the endpoints. Let's mark the new endpoints. Those are the endpoints for the new integral. Now let's notice which regions are above and below the axis. Regions C and E are above the axis. Region D is below the axis. So the value of this integral is the number 6. So these are signed areas. So another symbol for those numbers is just SA. 
SA is an, uh, another symbol for, for that. Again, that symbol, SA, is not one that the book uses, but I like it. Example two, graph of f of x is shown. Shade the region corresponding to this definite integral and find the value of the integral. So the definite integral goes from x equals minus six to x equals five. Well, let's find those endpoints on the graph. One, two, three, four, five, six, and one, two, three, four, five. So those are the endpoints of our region. Now let's shade the region that corresponds to the definite integral. I'm going to color code the shading. So there's the shaded region. Now let's find the, the value of the integral. Well, I'm going to start by drawing little pictures that represent the regions whose area I'm going to find. Now those are simple geometric shapes, so we can find their areas using uh, geometric formulas, but for that we should note the dimensions. Now we can use uh, geometry area formulas to find the values of those areas. So our answer is, our exact answer is 11 plus 2 pi. That's the only way to write that answer exactly, because pi is an irrational number. Now we can type that into a calculator and get a decimal approximation. That's this number. 17.28 is the decimal approximation. It's not exact, and even if you wrote down more digits, I mean, my calculator says 7.28318531. Even if I wrote down all those digits, that would still be a decimal approximation. The only way to write this answer exactly is to write 11 plus 2 pi. That's the end of that example. Let's go on. Now I want to discuss these properties of definite integrals. Uh, there are five of them. The first one is this one that says the definite integral from x equals a to x equals a is the number 0. The next property is this one that says the definite integral from a to b is the negative of the definite integral from b to a. So you see that the a got moved to the top and the b got moved to the bottom and the result was there's a minus sign in front. The rule number three is the constant multiple rule for definite integrals. If you have a constant times a function, and you find the definite integral, that definite integral will be the same as if you pull the constant out front and just find the definite integral of, of the function by itself. And then there's the sum rule. If you have a function f of x plus or minus a function g of x and you find their definite integral, that's the same as finding the definite integral of just f of x by itself plus or minus the definite integral of g of x by itself. And finally, this last uh, property, the definite integral from x equals a all the way to x equals c is equal to the definite integral from a to some number b, and then the definite integral from that number b on the rest of the way to x equals c. Now we've already seen a, an application of rule number five. In example two, we found this definite integral by finding these areas of these regions. Now notice that each of those circled things is uh, something that could be thought of as a definite integral of its own. This first signed area 
which shows up like that, would be the definite integral from minus 6 to minus 4. This second signed area here, which shows up on the graph here, would be the definite integral from minus 4 to minus 1. This third signed area shows up on the graph here, and that would be represented by the definite integral from minus 1 to 1. These two areas together correspond to this region on the graph, and that would be denoted by the definite integral from x equals 1 to x equals 5. So in example 3, we're given the values of some definite integrals. We're just given these. And we're supposed to compute some definite integrals using that given information. So question A is to find this definite integral. Well, notice we don't have a given value for that, of course. But we are given just the definite integral of x from 1 to 4 and the definite integral of x squared from 1 to 4. And notice that x and x squared show up in the integrand, but they're multiplied by these constants, 7 and minus 2. So let's use the sum rule and the constant multiple rule to break that integral up into two integrals and to pull out the constants. And there's our result. That initial definite integral equals this number. Question B. Find this definite integral using the given integral properties, these properties, and these given values. So there's our answer. We get the value minus 496 over 3, which is uh, the exact answer. A decimal approximation would be that it's roughly minus 165.33. We used two properties in doing this computation. The first was property 3, which is the constant multiple rule we used it to pull that constant multiple minus 4 outside the integral. The second property that we used was property 5. Property 5 was the one about integrating from A to C being the same as integrating from A to B and then from B on to C. So we integrated from 1 to 5 by integrating from 1 to 4 and then from 4 to 5. The reason we did that was because th that was the information we were given. We were given information about those integrals. Let's go on. Question C. Find this definite integral. Holy cow, look at that. 285 minus 17x plus 23x squared raised to the 13th power. That just seems awful. But wait a second. Look at the endpoints of the integration. Integrating from x equals 5 to x equals 5. Let's go up and look at our properties of integrals. The very first property says that if you integrate from x equals a to x equals a, that's just 0. Now why does that make sense? Consider a graph of a function f of x 
and a point X on the X axis. This integral symbol represents the area between the graph of f of x and the x-axis from x equals a to x equals a. But there is no area there. That's just a, a, a vertical line. So it makes sense that this definite integral would be 0. So let's go back and apply that to our example. This ugly looking integral is just 0. Finally, question D. The integral from 4 to 1 of 7x minus 2x squared. Hey, wait a minute. We integrated 7x minus 2x squared earlier. In question A, we integrated 7x minus 2x squared. But we went from 1 to 4. In the current problem, we're being asked to integrate from 4 to 1. Well, let's go up and look at our integral properties. Property 2 says the integral from a to b is the negative of the integral from b to a. So let's apply that to our current problem. So we get an answer of plus 57.75. We use the result from A that said this integral was minus 57.75. That's the end of that example, and that's the end of the video. Thank you.